fine single payer bill. And I have a website that I built with 40 of my peers over a period of a whole year working every Saturday for two hours on Zoom. It's called www.ourhealth.pub.pub, ourhealth.pub. Yeah. And essentially, it was originally named the California Lifetime Care Health Act to replace long-term care. But then I changed the name because I wanted to generalize and simplify the thinking about this thing. We're talking about our, which is all of us, and health, which we have to define because you can't buy health at any price. It's not for sale. Absolutely. And that website is the model, is the draft policy model that I'm extending into the nation for the advocate community that's working on single payer to end our current barbarous you know, uh, system, our yeah. carnivorous system. Well, yeah, and I urge people to go there, our, our health.pub. It's uh, a great place to go. And, and also, I, I do want to mention again that your book is Public Hostage, Public Ransom Ending Institutional America. One other topic that I want to get into, and I think we're on the on the same page in terms of single payer health care. Yeah. Goodness, seventy percent of uh, uh, Americans, by all the polling that I see, are in favor of single payer health care, and it's something that we need to move towards. And the reason that we're not moving towards it is because there are a few people that are making a whole lot of money, and they're making that money off of us and off of our pain and off of our suffering and off of our sickness. And I think that's that's disgusting. I, I would like to, to discuss some um, your thoughts about <clears throat> the, uh, the, the, the warehousing model, quote-unquote, and, and to the family-based model because um, – Depending on where you are in the country, depending on what state you're, you're in, a, you know the, the bur- there is a huge burden that is put uh, onto families. And while I think it is overall a better situation than than what we had in terms of in, in institutionalization, there is a there is a, a big burden that individual families, individual parents. Uh, especially moms uh, get burdened with in terms of unpaid labor that they that they have to perform in in this situation. Now there are many states in which um, for uh, for a child for uh, you know, children with, with disabilities, parents are able to get uh, paid hours for uh, for for doing that work. And there are other places where they are not. And I was I was following very closely. Uh, the recent passage of a bill in Oregon that allowed in a very limited way, even though it was opened up during the pandemic for for uh, parents of medically I- involved children to be able to be paid as caregivers. And then they shut the door at the end of that window. And I'm wondering how we go about that in a way that that opens that up because it it's it's a total patchwork. It depends on on where you are. Some states are are open about it and allow it. Um, and others are just starting to, but but are really, uh, you know, parsimonious uh, about the resources that they provide for parents, and other states don't allow it at all. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are in that system, so that so that it 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 so that we can improve it and make sure we don't go back to a warehousing model, but that that also it doesn't take advantage of of unpaid labor. Uh, on on the part of uh, you know parents and moms especially who work are working it's extraordinarily hard to make sure that their uh, kids uh, have experiences like any other kids would. So you know that my whole life has been in this field. This is my specialty is working with kids with special needs. That means I'm working with families with kids with special needs, yeah. and I'm totally clear totally clear about what you're talking about. I, because I was the coordinator of the single payer model, our health model, I built into that model, my understanding of the need for individualized planning and to buy out all front end medical debt. As we go into the transformation, that means whatever people currently owe in the way of medical debt, we would buy that out roughly at a penny per hundred dollars. And there's a fellow by the name of of Jerome Ashton 
who has a major website called Ending Veteran Medical Debt, which is going to show up in the middle of November. Just a brilliant strategy. He's reduced the debt for 10 billion people. Meanwhile, to go right to your question, there are 41 million people in America. So we're a country of what, 330 million? 41 million people are currently trapped in having to take care of some dependent member of their family for no reimbursement. Yeah. Notwithstanding that, for example, in California, we have a program called in-home support services, which may be replicated under different names in different states okay. in order to fund people that have the need to have somebody in their home to take care of them. And there's a patchwork of post-hospitalization, of physical therapy and rehab services and occupational therapy that work for a short period of time covered by Medicare for about 30 to 40 days, and then shifting over to Medicaid for the remainder of that of that coverage. But, but be clear, Medicaid is third-rate care, and to be eligible, you have to be on your knees yeah. uh, in order to be eligible for that. And many, many uh, clinicians will not accept Medicare rates because they're so uh, uh, insultingly low, they don't even cover the basic costs. Yeah. Notwithstanding, we have to have a single payer system that sweeps away all of these vestiges of anti-working class, anti-poor community, anti-special needs community politics that dominate because the people that set policy in our country serve the richest of the rich. Absolutely. No, I, 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 I couldn't agree with you more. And I think part of that is making sure that, that those uh, people who are performing that that unpaid labor uh, get resources and get compensated and that and and el- eliminate this patchwork system that allows so many millions of people to fall through the cracks all the all the the the, the dead end work that's going yeah. on the job lock that people experience the mind numbing work that people have to su- suffer in order to, to kind of just get a shred of, of medical coverage somehow yeah. the, the security work and all of the stuff that's going on all that needs to be swept away. I mean, all that is a result of the oligarchs in our country yeah. essentially concentrating their multi-billion dollar wealth at the expense of the entire mass of the people. You know, it's 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 the 99% of us yeah. that really are are paying the livelihoods of the 1% as we suffer and as our children suffer. We could transform this country profoundly. We need a vision. That, so the central policy, the central policy to begin to transform the society has to do with universal health care. It would address the climate issue. It would address poverty. It would address job lock. It would address medical debt. It would address tuition debt. For example, in, in the model that we're proposing, we would globally budget all public post-secondary professional health education training in the country in order to trade year for year for tuition coverage for a year of service in an urban or a rural desert somewhere in the country by establishing a health corps, a volunteer health corps. And so people were, uh, the, the, the bill is set up for California. We have probably somewhere in the vicinity of 60% of our state does not have a variety of specialists like gynecologists, for example, obstetricians in, in probably 60% of the state of California. I mean, it's, it's, it's so outrageous and we live with it and, and people tend to think that the problem is theirs alone. They don't get that we are all in the same boat. Yeah. We are all being exploited and yeah. that we could have the most ideal, almost utopian society if we began to organize and unify around our own interest. What happens, though, is when we challenge the oligarchs and their system, they essentially own all the major mass media. MSNBC, for example, is owned by the pharmaceutical industry. When you look at MSNBC, what I love, you know, I watch Rachel Maddow, I watch all those people. Right. So, Donald, every other ad is a drug ad. (laughs) Every other ad is an automobile ad. Yeah. So when you, when you want to look whether or not you're getting real information, you look to see who's advertising on that particular venue. If you're seeing drug companies and 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 product companies and auto companies, if you're seeing the capitalist system there, you know that you're only getting a partial partial truth. Yeah. 
it's filtered through the advertisers and they're not going to uh, buck the system for the people who are paying their bills. And you exactly. always have to be very cognizant of, of where that comes from. Um, this, this has been fascinating information, and, and I really appreciate uh, the degree to which you have taken the lessons that you've learned in your life and your experience and directed them towards shifting not only uh, that institution, not only that system, but the, but the health care system as a whole. And, and I really appreciate that you have like taken the effort and channeled your, your wisdom and, and talents towards that end because we need it more than ever before. Again, we've been speaking with William Bronston. He is the author of Public Hostage, Public Ransom, Ending Institutional America. Dr. Bronston, thank you so much for being with us today on Facepalm America. I would urge you to consider introducing your daughter to your audience and to share oh. your daughter's life and how she essentially is contributing to the society. Yes. In every way. <laughs> Absolutely. No, no. I, and, and I have on previous episodes uh, for, for listeners to uh, this podcast, they know that, uh, that my daughter ha- has uh, cerebral palsy and epilepsy and uh, IDD and that she is a, a very important part of my life and that the challenges that my wife and I have faced in uh, trying to make sure that she gets the care that she deserves and gets the experiences that uh, she uh, deserves um, have formed like the a, a great part of the impetus for why I do this podcast and why I'm uh, so passionate about uh, so many of the issues that I am. But uh, But yeah. Oriana is uh, is a big part of why I do this every day. So absolutely, no, they 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 they, they know, but I appreciate that. Let me just say that that, and you mentioned it. I mean, you introduced it earlier. It is the organized families around the defense organizations like United Cerebral Palsy, mm-hmm. Association for Retarded Citizens, ARC, mm-hmm. uh, National Autism, the the Down Syndrome Congress, all of these yeah. citizen defense organizations that have been organized in order to press for the inclusion of their children into a respected society is one of the most significant political powers in our society. In addition to organized elders, which is another major, major population that's organized for social and health justice. But the fact that, that the parent movement has been so reliable and so unified, notwithstanding that it's been divided by the doctor community. There's the spina bifida group and the muscular right. dystrophy group and the and the I mean it just goes on and on and on, all right. defined by the doctors, when really what we're talking about is adequate housing, adequate education, adequate vocation, adequate transportation, you know, yeah. regardless of what the diagnosis is. We, life is life, and yes. there's only resources. We we all need the resources right, to get us right. the basic things in order to live and survive. That's right. And so the, the the reality of those organizations is one of the most progressive forces. The danger is that they depend upon Medicaid, and they're scared to death to lose the fragment of care that comes in from Medicaid financing. They have to they have to belt up. And they have to understand that they have to end Medicare because Medicaid, because Medicaid is absolutely evil. It is evil. Wherever it, it penetrates, it is going to undermine the quality of life and limit choices, democracy, and quality, uh, you know, in, in people's lives. I, I, I am very happy to sweep up the 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 fractured uh, you know pieces of the current healthcare system if we can replace it with one comprehensive universal single payer system. It'll Let's, be the best in the world. We don't have to copy anybody else, and we don't have to have the limits that any other country has already had as they move along the road towards the ideal. We can create an American system that will be the model for the rest of the world. We have the money; we're already spending it, and it would cost pittance to everybody in terms of minor amounts of money, a couple, $300 a month, maybe, maybe, you know, in terms of adding to the already, you know, a $4.4 trillion that we're now spending 18% of the GDP. We're there. 
we're there, we're paying for it, we're just not getting it. Yeah, and yeah, we're, 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 we're paying for something, and what... 